أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به وعلى رحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويخفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار all praise and glory and thanks belong to allah we begin in his name, we seek his help and guidance in all our affairs. We ask Allah to purify our souls and cleanse our hearts, to complete the light of faith and to give, give us the full and proper understanding of Islam and its true application in life so that we are always pleasing to him and blessed by him and protected by him and we have the justified righteous hope of success in this life and in the next those whom Allah guides nobody can mislead them and those whom he leaves to stray nobody can guide them I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah the one who has no partners and I also testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is Allah's final messenger to all of humanity till the end of time now most of us might not agree with this, but it, it, it is a fact that to be able to preach is a privilege. But provided one knows what one's talking about. And one of the most dangerous things we can do is of course talk about Allah by making up things as we go along. And that means also talking about Islam by making up things as we go along. In terms of solutions we put forward, or the interpretations we come with, or even the stances we take, or positions we take or adopt with respect to the many challenges that we face. But nevertheless, having said all that, it is a privilege to be able to speak even one word that Allah has mentioned in the Noble Book in front of people. And a talk like this, I suppose, the theme talk, the conference is about drawing near to Allah. And I think there are many people amongst us who can, each one of them, give an excellent lecture on this subject because there are young and old as we have said but some of the old or elder people in our audience do have with them tremendous experience from what little I know having been in touch with them the, what they have gone through how they have seen things develop and change and take course over over the years you know in the end it's about being sincere it's about maintaining the obligations of worship it's about increasing knowledge and purifying the hearts being repentful, doing good deeds, drawing near to Allah. But what does it mean? Because we're not talking about physical things, and everybody knows that. Sometimes we make an argument about, about it as if these are items for confusion. But we all know we're not talking about physical things. It's to become more strong in faith, or to be purified. How does one do it? What are the steps to it? And I suppose that's what we are going to try and explore over this weekend, inshallah. 
But the point I would like to make right at the start is this, and it may sound arrogant or presumptuous, not so humble and modest and soft and tender and so on. But I want to make it because sometimes people accuse you of being haughty or too loudmouthed or too brash in our behavior or my behavior. And I feel they are wrong, but sometimes they are right. Because there are certain matters, we can make, take wrong decisions, certain matters we have to put our foot down and say the truth in categorical terms without allowing any scope for confusion. And you may argue all day long about how it could have been done more politely, but the truth was made clear. Polite or not, you can take it or leave it at least. You know what to reject, what to accept, what's on offer. So I believe, and that's my blunt statement, that our capacity for truth and justice of virtue makes Islam possible. That's the first problem we have in the wider community. Is Islam possible in this century, in these democratic, liberal, capitalistic societies? Is it possible in our time, with our people, given our problems, given, and it goes on and on. Negative, it bores you to death. Nothing positive to say. I think it is possible because people have the potential to do good. But man's inclination to injustice, that list, that unending list of horrible things that is going on and what people can do, makes it a necessity for Islam to be implemented. So that's my bold presumptuous statement. It's not only possible, Islam is necessary. We have to have it, otherwise we are all doomed. And that sounds, of course, to some people, how cocky of you, how could you say that? What about all the other philosophers and systems and... No, it's only Islam. So I'm going to start with two, on, on two notes of apology. First of all, speaking in front of elders, I always request some of these scholars or speakers and elderly brothers and sisters to be present in my talk, not because I want to show off, because at least they are there as a check and a guard and the presence of their blessings, and some of them will take it upon themselves to advise me. But it is awkward to speak in front of people. I may appear confident, but everybody knows how nervous I get, always get before lectures. Because knowledgeable people, elders who are more advanced in information or knowledge, worship, you know, one should be respectful. And we have many things that even somebody has written once, it is makruh to speak in, in, in a sitting if someone older is in, with, with you. So I hope I'm not doing something detested, disliked, inshallah. I said about uh, Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, that he was with one of his great champions of Islam, Sufyan ibn Uwayna, rahimahullah, and said, why don't you speak? The Imam Sufyan al-Thawri said to him, why don't you speak? And he said, not while you are around, not in front of you. So that's the first point of apology, if you like. I apologize because it is a bit condescending for me to speak to people and there's Sheikh Salim sitting there and many people. But I speak because I have to and I need to and I, it is my privilege. It's an honor. And secondly, and here's some, something which Imam al-Ghazali mentioned. He said, if those who do not possess knowledge avoid the scholarly discussions, disagreements will end. I hope I'm not going to add to controversies. Because I don't claim to be an alim. If only those people who don't have sufficient knowledge would stop talking about matters which are the privilege of the, not select few, but the qualified few, the honored few by Allah. Disagreements will cease, if not cease, reduce. So that's my second point. I hope anything I say which is untoward, weird, fantastic, so on, take it like that. Well, after all, he's just a person speaking. Does it have truth? Can we change, modify it? Is it a, does he have a point? But I'm not here to cause disagreements and create controversies. Brothers and sisters, before we could decide for or against Allah, before we could even show whether we are strong believers or we are against Islam, we are going to be loyal to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or we are going to be defiant and choose our own leaders because we know better. Any position we take, you and I, if we are Muslims, even before we were twinklings in our parents' eyes, even before the foundation of the earth was laid, even before the cosmos, the universe came into being, we were favored. We were favored by Allah.
if we are Muslims. Allah, out of his wisdom and his knowledge is eternal, chose you and I to be Muslims. Feel favored. Not arrogant and boastful and ten feet tall. It may sound like that sometimes. But internally, be thankful. We are favored by Allah despite our differences. Sometimes, I know some people have not deliberately come to this year's conference because things I have said or we have done five, ten years ago. Or because so and so is coming or we are not coming and boycotting everyone else. But you are Muslims. We are Muslims. Allah benefited you and I with faith. He joined us in the brotherhood of faith. Is that how you would like Allah to judge you and I, the way we judge each other? Allah favored us. And we are only trying to practice Islam. So who, like the proverbial statement of Jesus Christ, peace be on him, let him who, had, let him who has no seen, sin ca cast the, fir the first stone. Who is perfect? A non-practicing Muslim is an oxymoron. It's like saying, I'll take a bath without getting wet. I'm going to run while I'm sitting down. You cannot have such a thing as a non-practicing Muslim. And when we start to practice, what do you find? We start to run, we stumble and we fall. We hurt or graze our knee or worse injuries. We play sports, what happens? We practice Islam, we're going to get things wrong. We'll hurt each other. And our faith is not just a mere assent to facts, a sentimental embrace of an identity. Oh, we are Muslims, belong to a grand ummah, privileged few, chosen nation. It's not just a sentimental attachment. And our faith, our identity, our destiny is determined by goals. So what are those goals of Islam? It is not about the size of our jurisprudence. It is about the greatness of Allah. Perhaps that's what the problem is. We have forgotten a little bit about the greatness of Allah. We are so enamored with our own intellectual capabilities about how we have deduced and surmised Islam, its jurisprudence. That's why we are so argumentative. We have forgotten about the greatness of Allah because we have made ourselves great with the religion. So just as fire outside the fireplace is dangerous and a fireplace without the fire is useless same way this faith without as the content without the form the sunnah is useless and the sunnah make believing we look the part talk the part while the heart is full of all this stuff that negates iman from envy and hatred and resent, resentment and dislike about what Allah has said makes that invalid. But we want to be those furnaces which are strong, keeps the danger back and it's got a roaring flame inside and it provides warmth to everyone. Anyone can come and lay and then warm their hands at our hearths for comfort, relaxation, peace and while they're resting they'll find connection with their souls and become connected to inshallah we say Allah. Do you know evangel evangelicals, these are the Christian missionaries who are, their mission, their job is to go out and preach and convert people. And that's their task. Some are very organized, they have to do certain hours every day or every month, a quota system. They can take it to the extreme and they go all over the world and they do. And you can't just moan and complain. They have dedication, sincerity, sacrifice, striving. But these people, very hardworking people, many of them, under 30 years old, and I have the references with me. This is authored by David Campbell, a professor at Notre Dame. And you might have heard of the book called uh, uh, Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. He's co-author of this book, and he did the survey. He found most evangelicals under 30 believe that there are many ways to God, and you don't have to go through Jesus Christ. Isn't that sad? No, I'm not mocking Christianity, but isn't that sad? Here you are, spending money, even going and settling in foreign lands, in some tribal areas, some far-flung country. And most of you, young, the youngsters, believe, well, what's the point of it all? 
Is that how we are? Is that why we are spending money coming to conferences or doing anything we do? Because we believe in the end, well, there was another way anyway. There was another alternative to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are we intelligent because we are dedicated and sacrificing and spending, but we thought we had choice. We have a choice other than Islam, other than the deen as lived and taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Two-thirds of the evangelicals under 35 believe non-Christians will go to paradise. What's the point of being a Christian then? Oh, it's very broad-minded, it's very nice, how accommodating you are. I guess the world would love us to bits if we could say everybody goes to heaven. It's not I who send people to heaven. It's not you who can prevent me from going to heaven if Allah wants me to go. There must be a subject, not subject, objective criteria which decides who gets to go where. Just like this conference. If you hadn't bought your ticket, the rooms are finished. You can't come today and say, give me a room. There are no rooms. There's an objective criteria here. Have you paid the fees? Have you applied early enough? We can't build a room for you. 45% of the American Catholics do not know, and these are fundamental things, do not know that, that what, the, what the church teaches, that the bread and wine during the communion actually transubstantiates into the flesh, blood and flesh of Christ. Transubstantiation. They don't believe in it. They don't even know it happens. And they are the Catholics. And I'm told over half the American Protestants, the other half, broadly speaking, cannot identify Martin Luther as the person who inspired the Protestant Reformation. Why am I boring with all this stuff? To show how there can be dedicated people, well immersed in knowledge and proselytization, and yet remain so ignorant of fundamental facts about the religion. Any of you do not know La ilaha illallah? Any of you do not know that La ilaha illallah has keys, that it has teeth to the key? I will not open the door to paradise unless those conditions of the kalima are not met, are met. Any of you don't know? Is that how we are? We are not. So the world is watching and the world is judging. And Islam offers this watching world its best when? When this outward expression of ours, looking the part, talking the part, balances, is in harmony with the inside, the inward. Iman and the action, the amalus salihat. So this choice we are going to offer to people, we are saying to ourselves, when we are practicing, has to be of that nature. How did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam maintain steadfastness of the faith despite all the challenges and all the obstacles and all the insinuations as well as insults and abuses? He was never accused of becoming unkind or cruel or unjust. Yet he will keep, no one can say, therefore he compromised a bit there and gave a bit over there of Islam and changed a bit here there because they didn't like it. So somehow it is possible as human beings with the best of example, to have all the good qualities of Islam amidst oppression and opposition. And that's what, the, what we are trying to say. Offer that choice. Then it becomes true da'wah. That's the da'wah we are talking about. Something designed, something focused, something taking into account the issues we face without giving in to the pressures in such a way, Islam itself becomes a controversial subject. Who makes it controversial, if not shaitan? When we make the truth clear, that is when we are drawing near to Allah. Make the truth clear, even with a smile on the face, or whether we are wielding the sword and fighting in the battlefield. I don't deny, I'm going to say it again at this conference and people can record and they're recording. Why should I deny my past? You know, we can look back right, wrong and so forth. You know, are you really going to be cowed by the talk of people who are openly presenting their evidence against being invited to the mercy of Allah? You will die, I will die, all of us will have to die. 
If there is Allah and we say there is, if there is heaven and hell we say there is, if there is truth and falsehood and they're in contention we say there is, if the truth is what gets us, gets us into paradise and we say that is, that is so, then there are all these ayat about, about striving and sacrifice and so forth, yes. Brothers and sisters, fed up to the back teeth of trying to excuse ourselves, we are not terrorists. Every drama we put forward, every social cohesion thing, everything we want to put forward, little kids come along straight away, we are not terrorists, we don't jack bombs. What are you doing to your children? You say you love your children. <clears throat> this is something that the new Encyclopedia Britannica wrote. And he says in there, the Islamic interpretation of monotheism, Tawheed, is more literal and uncompromising than that of any other religion. So Islam is a choice. Of course, the world is watching. Make that choice clear. Tawheed is uncompromising. They know it. Allah is confessed as being one, eternal, unbegotten, unequaled, and beyond partnership of any kind. What a marvelous, fantastic definition of Tawheed. Any of that problematic to a Muslim? One, eternal, unbegotten, unequaled, and beyond partnership of any kind. That is Allah, your Lord and my Lord. That is the Allah whom we serve. We get it wrong, but our intentions are pure inshallah and because it is pure we make mistakes we amend we change we remain regretful but we must carry on not say wow I was bringing cups of tea and I spilt it burned my hand no more bringing tea for you what is this you still have to treat your guests well Sheikh Muhammad Mukhtar al Shankiti he said life either it will make you laugh and rejoice for an hour over which you will cry for an eternity. Or it will make you cry for an hour over which you will laugh and rejoice for an eternity. Okay, that is because people, when they have Iman and Tawheed, and they understand the transitory nature of this life, and they understand about the promises of the hereafter. You know, we do, as human beings, suffer weaknesses. And so we sometimes become burdened with the troubles, and we feel like we need to lie down and rest. But then we pick up and go again. We know that in the end, this is not eternal life. It comes from the same spring that people like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu drank from, the fountain of the Quran and Sunnah from the lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr used to say, our abode in this world is transitory. Our life in it is but a loan. It's loaned to us. Our breaths are numbered. How many times we inhale and exhale? It's numbered. But our laziness is so manifest. That's where it comes from. Whether it's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu or it's Sheikh Muhammad Muhtar al-Shankriti nowadays. And this chain of understanding. Life is temporary. And it's only worth living if we have connected with our Lord, Allah. Because somebody like Socrates come along, comes along and says, you know, 3,000 years ago, Greek philosopher, yes, not to be sniffed at. The unexamined life is not worth living. It sounds nice. It's a Twitter message, isn't it? The unexamined life is not worth saving. Yes, and I will put it out gladly. But examine it for what? How I haven't enjoyed myself and had my drink cup of wine yet? The unexamined life is not worth living when we have examined it and found ourselves still wanting to form, uh, wanting in this relationship with Allah. That He is our Lord, we are His slaves. So we are a community that teaches people how to live well by measuring their days. We measure our days, our time. We measure our days, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. We are measuring. Oh, 10 minutes left. Oops, 20 minutes too late. Quickly, we have almost missed Asr now. We are measuring. We live life well.
So don't make busyness. No, I'm busy. Busyness, an excuse. And it is, it is, as some people have said, it is moral laziness. Being busy, being too preoccupied. You know, it's like the addiction, addiction worka workaholic, to become so busy, don't have time, engrossed in this life, this dunya. To do what? So we scramble to, for what? To build ourselves an image which is enviable to other people. About what? It's all looks. It's all exterior, isn't it? Look at my muscles to look at the length of my beard. To It could be look at my flashy car to look at my paycheck. What is it? Success. Boasting about what? So busyness is, as some people have mentioned, the social, uh, uh, social scientists have done this work. It's really a form to um, overcome the inward anxiety to be recognized to be successful. Not that you are successful. To be recognized that you are successful. By whom? The people. My friend, my neighbors, they will say, hasn't he done well? Look at his two houses he's got and the flashy car he drives. And we are all dependent on Allah and one night things can change. I personally know people who have lived in mansions, had great jobs, they are now on the streets, drunk. One of them, particularly close to me, is actually now sent down to, round to schools to talk about homelessness. I know people personally in Suffolk, not one, number of them like that. Well-placed people in society, in the streets. Sometimes family, domestic problem, my wife threw me out. Two because blowing it all in a gambling in one night. Brothers and sisters, life has an orientation. It has a final end. And we are always moving towards something. And when we say we're drawing near to Allah, we want to make sure that we don't become people who have to wait a long time before commenting. Like what uh, Muhammad Ali said one day, he said, life is not real. I conquered the world and it did not bring me satisfaction. Alhamdulillah, he became a Muslim or he found Islam and so forth. But you and I don't have to wait when Allah has given us the intelligence and the heart to feel all the time. And we are already Muslims. That's why I said before we were born, Allah favored us. It has no meaning. Nothing which is truly beautiful. This is a Christian philosopher. He said, nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context or history. Therefore, we can only be saved by faith. Faith in what? In myself? That's defiance. Whether we are someone like Muhammad Ali or we're somebody like this uh, Reinhold Naibu. Faith. Whether you are someone like Isaiah Berlin talking about the human rights. Someone safe from the gas chambers. Or whether you are a human rights activist like Michael Ignatieff. Or Simon Perry. A, a, a theological philosopher always say faith and none of them can tell you what faith is because maybe there are many ways to God but you and I we know there is only one way so I can benefit and I do benefit from reading all sorts of books from all sorts of people but if it were not for the guidance of Allah I would have been gone by now and then, of course, if it were not for the du'a that the people make for me, especially scholars and teachers and elders. Because I remember one, one day I said to one particular learned man, and I said, I'd like to do a, de do a degree in philosophy. And he warned me against it. Because there's an inherent fear, can confuse, can make your mind all messed up, and then you're all confused. Well, whether I do a degree in philosophy or not, I like reading, I read a lot of books, I don't feel any less about a tawheed and dying for Allah. I don't, alhamdulillah. Say to whom belongs the earth and all beings? قُلْ لِمَنْ لَرْدُ وَمَنْ فِيهَا إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعَلَمُونَ Soon they will say, أَفَلَا, uh, it belongs to Allah. قُلْ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Will you not then remember? قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالسَّبْعِ وَالرَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ who is the Lord of the seven heavens and the Lord of the supreme throne? They will soon say, Lillah, قُلْ أَفَلَ تَتَّقُونَ Won't you then have that piety, that fear, that respect, that reverence, that caution? 
Who is it? Who is it? In whose hands is Malakut Kulli Shayin? The affairs of everything. In Kuntum Ta'alamun. If you really truly know, who is it? They will soon say, Lillah, it belongs to Allah. So how are you deluded? Why are you stupid? You go to Harry's blog if you have time and you will see the sort of stuff they are writing about people, including myself. Oh, Manwar is intelligent, but he's pretending this and pretending that. I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is people can become affected by the work that we do by the grace of Allah. Because you can be even someone like in, in the shadow of Nuh alayhi salam giving your whole life and not get one person take the shahada. It's not proof of anything that hundreds of people become Muslim at your hands. But the point is this, when people are making an inroad into society, there are going to be those who will not like you. So we need to adapt, adapt and be contextually clever and everything in the end. But some things, what will you give up for what? Give up nothing about Islam for anybody on earth. And those whom Allah will guide, will guide either through you or someone else. So there are many reasons why you must question the amount of attention nowadays being paid to religious experiences. You know, it has to be all about an experience. We give you this and give you that. What Islam has to offer to the world is not a religious experience. It's not a spiritual thing. You go to a big cave or a cavern or a, a, I don't know, Cheddar Gorge or something. And you walk in there and the lights are flare, and blare, you know, flashing and put some classical music on and you listen to things and say, oh, you're awe-inspired. It's a spiritual moment. You gain nothing about God. You know nothing about how to worship Him, how to be right or wrong. You just felt something. Maybe humble, maybe tiny, maybe puny, but so what? You come out and there you go. Ha ha he he and that's it, finished. Islam does not offer religious experiences, not even a unique way of life. It, what we say, it offers, it, it, it makes all of us to stand under the judgment and grace of Allah as do all people. That's a hard thing to understand, but it's very simple. We are all under the judgment of Allah and the grace of Allah. It has, it is a message to the world embedded in a story. Story of truth versus error through the lives of the prophets and the righteous. It is nothing less than God given or Allah revealed message and a story. And you need to be passionate about it. We need to be passionate about it. Okay, passion. When, when can we have passion? A passion is when we can distinguish between the container and the content, isn't it? If we understood the worth of Iman, what it really means to have la ilaha illallah in our hearts, what that really means when we are told it can outweigh the earth on the scale of judgment. We can have passion. But if we have interest in the jurisprudence and all this argumentation of what is superior, what is not, you're comparing what Allah gave, trying to make it as if, as if it's comparable to what we fought off, fought up, cooked up. You can lose that passion. He said, well, I concede that philosopher X and Y has maybe a point. No. Who dares to have a point against Allah and His Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That sounds uncompromising, defiant. Well, when you get to know us, you will see us the most easygoing people. Because by definition, if we have faith, we have rahmah. And we care for the best of all. And if we have roughness in our character, smooth it out for us. But don't expect us to throw away the content for the container. Many were the ways of life that have passed away. Many were the ways of life that have passed away before you. Travel through the earth and see what was the end of those who denied it and gave lie to it. And وَمَنْ يَبْتَغْ غَيْرِ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينَ فَلَنْ يَقْبَلُوا مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ If anyone desires a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him. 
and they will be in the ranks of the losers in the hereafter. So these are categorical, these are well known, we understand this. So this is our faith. So remember this, no matter how much, I will finish in about 15 minutes, no matter how much the devil has fine manners, he can still only take you to one place. Yeah, a devil with fine manners will still carry you and I to hell. Unless we think hell is just an abstract concept, it's a symbolic thing. It's a metaphor for pain and anguish and suffering. No, it is fire and brimstone, my friend. It sounds old, Victorian English church-like talk. Well, that's what they have lost. We have still got it, alhamdulillah. It is fire and brimstone, gnashing of the teeth, and weeping and wailing of tears of blood. So Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said, the one who wants to know who he really is, let him present himself to the Qur'an. We are slaves of Allah. Allah has spoken. His words are there, preserved for us. Let us see ourselves. Abu Darda wrote to Salman al-Fasi, radiallahu anhuma. He wrote to Salman al-Fasi and said, come to the holy land. So Salman al-Fasi, radiallahu anhu, wrote back and said, indeed, the land does not make a person righteous. It's not the land. Wherever you and I are, wherever you are, whether in Mecca, whether in some back street in London, ghetto, it's not the land, it's the deeds of a man that makes him pure. The actions. What are our actions? The few scant actions we are trying to do, why wouldn't we support each other? Why bring all these suspicions and negative talk and why? Why the divisions? Why the lack of enthusiasm to come forward? You want to do it, do it then. You want me to come and join you? Do it then. I'll join you. You will not lead, you will not support, you will simply moan or you wish us to be go away. What's the problem? What is the matter? I wish somebody would explain to me. There are things that we have been trying to do for 20, 25 years. Sometimes the support is so little. Allah has honored you and I, you know, with uh, dignity in a therapeutic culture because everything is lost, everything is vacuous, no meaning. And we've been saying this last for five years, I think. From materialism to the, all the stress of trying to have two jobs at the same time to pay for your mortgage. You know, husband and wife both have to work, otherwise, you know, our house is going to be repossessed. Everything under the sun, you know, from drug addiction to, you know, how can I keep down a job because of my boss? And it's horrendous. We need something therapeutic. In a therapeutic culture, what's the lingua franca of that? It's psychology. And they tell us that when we are in a living in a therapeutic culture, the message is always to subvert the absolute truths. That there's a right and a wrong. Everything becomes relative. Okay. But Allah has honored us with intellect. Okay? Okay. We have honored the sons of Adam, provided them with transport on land and sea given them for sustenance things good and pure, conferred on them special favors, and preferred them above a large part of her creation. So we are honored, and we have intellect. That's what Ibn Abbas said, radiallahu anhuma. We can think, we can feel. Animals can think and feel. But they are instinctive, and we are not. Do you not feel, should I not feel, that we are better than animals? Because our scientists tell us, in the public, this, this I've taken from the Time magazine. They tell us there are chimpanzees that can think like humans in some experiments. They can learn a hundred words. That's a huge vocabulary for a monkey. There are dogs that demonstrate social skills by pointing fingers. There are crows bending wires to create fishing hooks. There are elephants which seem to mourn the dead. But they are all on instinct. God-given instinct. You and I have at least instinct and intelligence. And yet we choose something else. So Allah is merciful. And he invites us to his graciousness, even those who are his enemies. But he wants us to use the intelligence he gave us. And the intelligence tells us to accept whatever the one who knows most gives us without questioning. We refer to our experts, we refer to Allah for guidance in life. 
It's as simple as that. The key is humility. It's, it's who is talking? Who is giving it us? It's Allah telling us. It's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling us. And it's as simple as that. So this is what we have to understand that in the end I have to remove this barrier, this ego, this, this big-headedness inside me which makes me think I can be more clever than the one who knows everything. Because animals don't behave in a stupid manner. But people do. I do. So the death of the self is what I have to create in order to have life of the heart. You know, if you try to be somebody else, it's, it's no good because in trying to be somebody else, it's just a waste of time. You should just be yourself. And if I'm myself, I know that I am really not possessed of much. I need a lot of hand-holding, a lot of support, sympathy, and I'll cry on the shoulders of a young brother to I might just get carried away and jump up and down like a small child. And I, oh, how indignified. You're supposed to be 50 years old. Why are you behaving like a kid? So we know who we are. We're all tall and tough and strong, but it's a masquerade. It's a mask. Deep inside, we know we are all in need of someone, Allah. We know that, to see us through, and we are all dependents of him. O oh, you who believe, give your response to Allah and his messenger when he calls you to that which will give you life. We are calling to life. Allah is calling us to life, and we are saying drawing near to Allah means become alive. Remove that ego, kill the self, and become alive with the heart that beats for Allah. Then everything is doable. And if it doesn't happen, we've already got a reward. It can't be, it can't be anything else. Allah does not expect a morality out of a relationship. The relationship is Allah is Lord, we are slaves. He defines the relationship first. We all know that. Every child knows that. It's a relationship first, establish it first, then comes the morality. It's not ethics, we sit and say, oh, I think it's good, I think it's bad. These are my exper social experimentations. No. We are slaves of Allah. I need to know that, I need to feel it and be humbled by it. Allah dictates, Allah orders, Allah gives, but out of his mercy and graciousness. And he never means harm. And he's never give us un given us anything, anything at all which is against our interest in this life, let alone the next. Never. If I sicken my heart thinking like that, then I have not accepted Allah properly. I don't work for extrinsic motivators. It's not for reward of anything except that Allah is pleased. That's how it should be. And that's why I need strength and I need you to support, or we need to support each other. The Messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 10 minutes. Allah has shared out your attitudes amongst you just as He shared out your provisions. Allah has done that. Even before we were born, Allah decided we are going to be Muslims. Allah has shared us our sentiments, attitudes, feelings, thoughts, beliefs. Just as He has shared out your provisions, Allah gives worldly provisions to those whom He loves and those whom He does not love. Things Allah gives to people whom He might not love. But he gives religion only to those whom he loves. Only to those whom he loves. Hadith Sahih, according to Allah al-Bani, rahimahullah. So whoever is given religion, Allah loves him. Allah loves you. Allah loves me. Be positive. Even when we cry, we look sullen or sunken. We feel serious. We look dejected. We are still happy. Close that door. We still feel happy. Because Allah loves us. We are Muslims. Allah loves you. Feel it. Know it. And when Allah loves us, for many reasons He may deny certain things to us. It should not daunt our intentions or aspirations. Whether you're building a masjid or you want to die as a shaheed. You will die as a shaheed in your bed. But wish for it. But don't go looking for a fight. You don't spoil for a masjid. You don't spoil for a da'wah scene. Be sincere. Countless and one reasons we want. Why? Why would Allah guide us? It, it feels awkward to say, why would Allah love us? It feels awkward to say, for no reason, but perhaps that's what it is. 
In the end, after contemplation, debate, perhaps that's what we are going to have to accept. Actually, actually we don't know why. Why are we Muslims? Why did Allah love us? Because Allah loves us. He gave us deen. We are still Muslims. Why? And that's why we are called to love one another. Allah loves us, gave us, gave us Islam, and He still loves us. Why can't we love each other? That's why we are asked to love one another. He loves us because He loves us. It's as simple as that, or as profound as that. What can Allah gain by your punishment if you are grateful and you believe? It's just for us to be grateful. Now it is Allah that recognizes all good and knows all things. What will he gain? In shakartum wa amantum wa kana Allahu shakiran alima. If you were grateful and you believed, what can he gain by punishing us? So it doesn't have to be extraordinary. It has to be something not fatigued. It has to be all the time there. Nothing extraordinary. It has to be genuine, even if it's small. That's what we have to do. The Messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hadith in Musnad Ahmad, the Muslim Ummah is a unique Ummah. It's special. Amongst the whole of mankind, their land is one, their war is one, their peace is one, their honor is one, and their trust is one. Did Allah betray us? Did your Rasul betray you? We betray each other through suspicions and false accusations and slander. If we are Muslims of Tawheed, we are a unique nation. And they can laugh at you. They can say you are different, but laugh back at them and say you are all alike in your rejection of Allah. You laugh at me because I'm weird. We're different, oh Muslims. Well, I laugh at you, you're all so stupid, running after the world. Yes, a sister wrote, I don't know who the sister is, but it's a sister and I thought it was so wonderful. She said, when you sit with the people of the dunya, you become a drop in their ocean. But when you sit with the people of the akhirah, the dunya becomes a drop in your ocean. Okay. Just sister, I don't know who she is, Alima or anything, I don't know. But it's so true. It's so true. You know, five minutes left, but there's so much, so much there. I went back because I deal a lot with um, trying to benefit from what Christian theologians have spoken about. And this person called Gary Anderson, an Old Testament professor, and he referred to Proverbs. And it's a wonderful statement from the proverb, of course, Old Testament. It says, it says, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. And he says, I've been going to church my entire life, and I've never heard a sermon on that passage, which is a very provocative text. Entire life. You never heard something like this. For those who give in charity, men and women, in the musaddiqeena wal musaddiqati, and loan to Allah a beautiful loan. hasana. It shall be increased manifold, and there shall have besides a liberal reward. Allah has said in the Quran, if you loan to Allah a beautiful loan, He will double it to your credit. He will grant you forgiveness, for Allah is most ready to appreciate service, most forbearing. Halim, Al Halim, knower of what is hidden and what is open, exalted in might, full of wisdom. Because of all this, we come, in, come across ayat like this day in and day out. Look what others are missing with a lifetime of study and visits to the devotional places. And we read it every day when we recite the Quran. It's there, staring us in the face and we are not moved by it. And we are still selfish or greedy and clutching on like the drowning man clutching onto the straw. In hope of what? To be saved from what? You are going to sink without Allah. Majority of the Christians now, we are told, converting in China and other places is because of domestic reasons, and most of them are women. 
And that's going to be a powerhouse, not just in economical terms, military sense as well. 20 years' time, you will see. So we have to be ca careful about what we bury in our hearts. We're we'll finished now, inshallah. What do we bury in our hearts? It might not be dead. It might be something gnawing from inside and devouring us from within. And those things of hatred and envy and jealousy and resentment and all that arrogance and pride and boast and stuff, all of these things, they are going to destroy us from within. So it's not just a question of suppressing things. You know, let us be, understand. The knowledge that we absorb, it should be absorbed into the heart so it removes the darkness and fills it up with light. This is what Ali is talking about, Radhi Alan, when he says of two kinds. Something absorbed, something on the lips of people. That is internalizing. It's not Sufistic stuff for me. It's not philosophy for me. I know what it means. Feed it from within. Let it condition our being. Let it not just be a lip statement. That's what it is. So let's finish, inshallah ta'ala. This is the last page. There are things we have to do. We need courage. Everyone, I think, knows more or less, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, how to be success successful in front of Allah through sacrifice and dedication and so forth. But in the end, it requires certain other qualities which we need each other for strengthening. Courage or bravery. Not bravado, bravery. Courage. You know, when the, the odds seem to be stacked against us so much. Be like Tipu Sultan, who said, I would rather be a lion for one day than be a jackal for a hundred years. Or be like Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, the much maligned scholar, the father of terrorism now. who was nothing of the kind. Ask the one who knows, at least the one who has spent his life studying his works at Oxford University. He will tell you. If you want, don't want to take it from the Salafis or Sufis or Diobandis or Hanafis, okay, take it from your Oxford scholar. Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, what can my enemies do to me? My paradise is in my heart. That's what I'm going to finish on. My paradise is in my heart. It is with me wherever I go. To imprison me is to provide me with seclusion, privacy. You know what we are complaining about? To send me into exile is to send me away in the path of Allah. To kill me is to make a martyr of me. Never afraid. Never be afraid to die. We are going to die. Sounds morbid, sounds moronic even to some people. The trials are strong, the temptations are strong, confusion is strong, and there's a lot of uh, factors that play nowadays. Uh, we might not perceive it, but we are uh, our own tools against our own children nowadays in how we are bringing them up. That is why last week I showed all my pictures from 15, 10, 15, 20 years back that I have kept to show them this is Abu Muntasir with his Kalashnikov and his RPG and his gun in his hand. He, your father fought in Afghanistan. Your father sent people to Bosnia. Your father fought in Burma. Your father took up a gun and fought in Kashmir. And I'm proud of it. Alhamdulillah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah 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 wa la ilaha illa an